Good evening, everybody. This is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com. Welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast, where we examine the art and science of games. We've got a great cast for you tonight. Fortunately, James couldn't make it, but we're going to be discussing sort of the history of two very popular game genres. And as you guys know from listening to previous casts, these are topics that not only do I love to talk about, but they're ones we could easily spend five to ten hours on easily, as my recent cast with Plastic Games could attest to. Hopefully, we won't go that far over a half a day, but of course, we'll see what happens. My guest tonight is the owner of the Game Design Forum, as well as an author on several books relating to game design and sort of the history and tracking how it has evolved over the years. Please welcome to the podcast this week, Patrick Hullman. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, Patrick. It's great to have you on. As we were talking about before the cast, I actually met Pat at the local Philadelphia IGDA chapter. Wow. <sighs> like four or five years ago, maybe even a little older than that. Don't feel too old. <laughs> oh, on these casts, I've been, uh, someone has called me Old Man Josh, so that feels really great for me. <laughs> But it's always kind of interesting, again, like how fast the industry has really evolved. And that's been sort of like a common theme we've been having this year, with just how quickly things have grown and changed. And as someone who has been studying design and written these books, I think you can certainly agree with that. Well, I mean, uh, for me, the, the the biggest thing that's changed is that the discussion about video games mm-hmm. has really broadened um, yes. enormously I would say since probably 2010, mm-hmm. a lot of people – or probably 2009, late in 2009, a lot of people got started writing about games and then doing um, videos especially with you know the rise of um, you know uh, channels and YouTube. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of design material out there whereas when I started – I mean I started the website because I thought there wasn't a lot about video game design. I yeah. thought there was – Plenty of commercial stuff, but um, I started the game design forum just because I thought, well, you know, what about how do you how do you make these games? Not not just technically speaking, but like how do you make games fun? And yeah. I thought there was very little about that online, and mm-hmm. I think now there's a rather great wealth compared to what came before. Mm-hmm. You know, I had like similar ideas with Game Wisdom back in 2012, and things have certainly have grown. I think, as you said, Patrick, it's really opened up since like 2010, 2009, not just with game design. But also with more topics relating to the industry, especially with uh, the industry becoming more inclusive for people, uh, recent issues with um, game corruption or industry corruption, and even stuff as serious as uh, working conditions, people being you know overworked or pushed too far. And this, these kinds of conversations, we really didn't have them, especially for me growing up in the late 80s and throughout the 90s. That was still when the game industry was still considered very niche. Like, no one really seemed to care about it. But it has really grown and transformed into something else since then. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree that – I don't know whether it's just the um, sort of explosion of the industry as a whole, which has driven you know more information about the industry coming out or whether – I mean, I think one big thing is people retiring from AAA mm-hmm. um, and either moving out of the industry altogether or moving to indie. Yeah, um, they're you know no longer beholden to uh, you know an HR department which tells them not to say things to the media that aren't um, you know reviewed by a team of lawyers first. <laughs> so I think that really helps um, for people to understand what goes into the making of games. But also like you know video game design programs at, at universities have mm-hmm. really sort of popped up and. At that point, you know, you have to generate material that tells people what it's like to make games because otherwise, you know, you can't teach them. Definitely. You're certainly not going to just do it out of, off of a blackboard the entire time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, really goes back to, again, how much the industry has really changed in the last six, seven years, not just with more information, but also becoming a lot more accessible to people. We've been talking about this on the podcast several times, but the rise of development platforms like Unity, digital distribution with Steam, Humble Bundle, etc. It's becoming, a, it's, well, I should say it has become a lot more easy and feasible, or I'm sorry, a lot easier and feasible to basically go out on your own and make your own design rather than, you know, being stuck at a major studio, as you just said, Pat, you know, being stuck chained to like an HR department, you can't say anything without getting their approval, etc. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I've certainly heard that people who have left AAA development have told me that you know, it's it's different than it used to be, um, and and a lot of that wouldn't have been possible without distribution services like Steam or good old games or Desera. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just digital distribution is has really opened it up, um, and it, it's it's difficult. Like, I don't, as someone who studies the histo- history, like historical trends in game design, I don't. I don't know what's going to come next. Obviously, mm-hmm. like I mean, it's yeah. just with, if with the democratization of gaming, like of game design and game development, um, you know, literally anything could happen, mm-hmm. um, and the technology now allows people to do pretty much anything. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, and I mean, hell, we could easily transform this cast into you know what future trends or what big things we're seeing on the horizon now. I mean, there's just so much available to talk about these days, and it really has become a treasure trove for people like you and I, the uh, analysts and the people who are very interested in studying game design, seeing how things work. And with Game Wisdom, especially with these casts, I've had a chance to talk to so many game developers. Again, people who have either gone from AAA to Indie, first time, you know, students, or enthusiasts turn student turn developers, and even uh, developers who you know started in the international space. I've talked to people in Africa, India, Brazil, and it is just fascinating to hear all these different stories. And I've said this multiple times on the cast, but it bears repeating that there is no one way to become a game developer these days, or there really hasn't been. Everyone has their own unique story, their own philosophy, their own uh, style of design. And you can't just read one book, you know, how to make a game, and that's it kind of thing. I don't, I don't think such a book could exist. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> if that book existed, uh, you, the, I think the game industry would be very impoverished. I think the differences <laughs> between video games yeah. are uh, – more profound than most people probably think about. Not, yeah. not that it's impossible to realize, but I think mm-hmm. just people don't put their minds to the different, like how different, mm-hmm. uh, you know, World of Warcraft is from, you know, something like, uh, I don't know, like a Steambirds. Mm-hmm. Just like profound, profound differences in yeah. scope, players, how you do it, what skills you need. It's just all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, we can talk, we can be as um, high level as just different games in the same genre. We can even get really technical with, um, looking even at like games in the same series or even beyond that. I recently put a post about sort of the challenges with reviewing games through a 7 to 9 scale. And it's one of the things, as you just said, Pat, that a lot of people don't really think about. There's not a lot of discussions that are happening at sort of the analytical or the philosophical side of what makes a game good or what makes a game bad. I mean, hell, even like things I've talked about in the past, like replayability, control design, UI, these are all elements that there could be entire courses taught on just each one. They're just that involved. Yeah, I mean, just even the the explosion of of understanding the different roles in in game development is, is, Mm -hmm. I know, really has, I guess it has to a certain degree included people who would not ordinarily have been included, even as much as that's a hot button issue of, you know, the the homogeneity of some parts of the game industry. Um, Mm -hmm. But like the understanding that of like just having a UI designer Mm -hmm. as a separate role is, that's kind of radical actually. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. not radical for software, Mm -hmm. which, you know, that's always been a practice in software, but it's radical in the sense that, um, you know, I think the only game that had like a UI designer that wasn't just like a menu. I mean, I can think, I can think of lots of menu designers from back in the day. It's like, Mm -hmm. like uh, secret of mana or final fantasy, but, uh, Mm -hmm. I can't think of like a, someone coming and just being in charge of like the the UI, like uh, someone who was a senior position in UI. That's yeah, that's totally new. Yep. Yeah, and uh, speaking about sort of like the new hats and new roles, we're seeing a lot, especially with the independent scene, sort of the challenges of marketing and PR and how that's sort of like a new face for a lot of indie developers to wrap their head around. Because what we see a lot in the AAA market, as you said, the uh, homogenization that, you know, one studio is made up of 40, 50 people. You have a separate PR department. You have separate art, separate UI, etc. But when you're like a four or five man studio, everyone pretty much has to do these multiple roles. And one of the things that's kind of, I think, I want to say shocking, but maybe sort of 
a challenge to get accustomed to is being a PR person. And when I've spoken to a lot of independent developers over like the last two years, like even just being this recent, even like they say, you know, this whole PR thing is new to me. I don't know what I'm doing kind of thing. And it's becoming, I think, a lot more important for a role. And I think this is something I, this is another topic we could probably talk about a whole cast on it, but as, again, someone who's been studying game industry over the last, or over like, well, we could say like two decades, even maybe a little bit more than that by now, of, in your opinion, Patrick, how do you see sort of like the state, like, have you been tracking like independent developers or sort of the state of the independent industry lately? I mean, I've absolutely, some, I, I'm involved in a few independent mm-hmm. game projects myself, um, mm-hmm. nothing major, nothing published yet. But, um, you know, and especially um, one of the, the things that's really important to me is Kickstarter because that's how I yes. obtain a lot of my funds. Um, and certainly when you look at Kickstarter, like the biggest thing for me is you get a five-man team. They promise the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they mm-hmm. do a you know, Kickstarter for, you know, the, the price of an expensive car, and mm-hmm. then they can't deliver. Um, that's a big problem, I think. I, I've certainly been tracking that. That's If I had to say one thing, it would be tracking independent developers who – I wonder if they can come through and haven't come through or have come through. I, th- I think if you look at um, people like Zaboid Games who have delivered time and again on mm-hmm. any Kickstarter effort they've made, or um, you know a few other developers. Uh, the one of them is um, I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, group that did it, which is um, game out coming out probably this year called Shadows of Adam, which is just mm-hmm. like, like sort of a tiny, almost novella esque. Um, JRPG that you know involves a, a team of I want to say about five guys. They can they'll maybe they'll hear this and correct me on Twitter, and I, I apologize to you guys. But um, they have a few industry veterans in there who you know left either left AAA or have AAA still going on, um, who wanted to make you know the games that they wanted to make. They wanted to do something yeah. unique, and um, they did a Kickstarter. They got a little bit of money, um, not a lot, but they really had a really good clear idea of what their scope was going to be um and now they've made this game and it's actually getting being being tested right now and it's it's not like it's not what you think of like your typical rpg maker interactive fiction they really um put the legwork into it but they also stuck to a reasonable scope so you you get like a seven hour game right and a seven hour rpg is something that never would have happened after 1985 i mean that's just mm-hmm. ridiculous um if you think of like if you're looking at the historical perspective you just you wouldn't have that because that's not the scope. Like RPGs after, you know, after say Ultima, I don't know, Ultima three or four, you definitely wouldn't be getting, you know, five hour RPGs. That's just, that was not, they wanted to go big and they certainly did. And you look at the explosion of games like Wizardry and then Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest and um, RPGs were big, but here's these guys, they realized their limitations, they realized their funding. They said, okay, let's do a small novella sized RPG and, and see if that works. And, and they have, um, and it's going to be interesting for me. Cause like, that's something that I would, I would look at regardless of whether it's a good experience for me. I, 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 th- I think RPGs have evolved beyond, um, the kind of simple template that those guys mm-hmm. wanted to do. But I don't, I don't think that, I don't think they're wrong for wanting to do that. I think that taking a risk like that in this marketplace is going to be a very interesting one. Like, can that model succeed? Can you have an RPG that comes out after Disgaea or Bravely mm-hmm. Default or Dark Souls that is simple and straightforward and lyrical? Can can you is that is that going to work? Is that going to fly in today's market? You know, you think about like Final Fantasy XIII and how inc- incredibly complicated that was mm-hmm. in terms of game mechanics. Like after that came out, can a simple RPG succeed? Um, mm-hmm. And that's something I really, I would really like to see. I, I want to know the answer, whether the answer is yes or no. Yeah, and the same can also be said of the platformer genre, which will be the other one we're talking about tonight. Platformers were really the sort of like they were pretty much like one of the core like foundation genres of the game industry back in the mid '80s. I mean, hell, we Super Mario and the like pretty much really kickstarted the second revival of the game industry and absolutely i, I think that um a platformer was you know super mario brothers uh, bros mm-hmm. i guess to, be, to use the yeah. correct term in 1985 um was the first game of a certain type uh, I'll probably get into later in the episode um mm-hmm. that uh mm-hmm. really changed the way the games are designed um yeah. forever and mm-hmm. you know it, it happened to be a platformer it probably could have been something else but it was a platformer but i think platformers 
for a good solid decade, sort of during mm-hmm. the, the pinnacle of Miyamoto's career, were the place where strides in design were being made the fastest. Um, yeah. Whether that's incidental or not, I don't know, but that is certainly is the case. Mm-hmm. And again, as we said a few minutes ago, with being able to analyze and take a deep look into game design, the philosophy of it, I mean, each genre in of itself could be a good, you know, a year's worth of study. And platformers especially, like, as you just said with the RPG market, there's sort of that difference between the very complicated, very um, numbers-heavy RPGs, and then you have a lot of uh, more... Uh, simplify or more streamlined ones. And we saw a lot of those from the independent market. And the same can be said of platformer uh, level design, platformer game design as well. Over the last few years, for instance, I mean, look at something like Braid versus Super Meat Boy. Yes, they're both platformers, but they couldn't be any further apart from each other. And that sort of evolution of the platformer, what it means, really extended out to other genres. I mean, in the mid-90s, we saw the quote-unquote Metroidvania appear, thanks to Symphony of the Night, or we could actually say with Metroid before then. But as you said, Pat, the platformer became sort of the baseline for what a game was from, again, like mid to late 80s into pretty much, I think, like right to like 95, 96, when we started to see the 3D era take over. And as a good um, in- coincidence there, Super Mario 64 came out. And then that sort of redefined what a 3D game was. And then, you know, the whole cycle just started over again. I mean, I- I'd say that <sighs> probably the-, the era of the platform would be 1985 to 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, and the game that came out that changed the way the games are made all over again would be Half-Life. Um, mm. Although I don't-, I don't really want to go into shooters too much because... Uh, yeah. There's a lot of people analyzing shooters. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like shooters are in good hands, but if during that 13 year period, I felt like uh, I feel like um, you know sh- the, the the platformer, mm-hmm. especially the Nintendo platformers, uh, were the bar that that new games had to leap over in terms yeah. of quality and production value and um, what games could be like. If you think of like after Mario 64, how many scavenger hunt open 3D hub worlds mm-hmm. were there? Um, yeah. There were a lot. Mm-hmm. And that's because you know Mario Super Mario sixty four really captured the des- the des- designer's imagination or the imagination of designers everywhere mm-hmm. as to what a game could be and sort of I don't know I guess it pigeonholed people to a little bit a uh, small mm-hmm. degree but I think that's inevitable when a major work of art comes through the industry. Yeah, and I agree that Half Life sort of then transitioned some things and then from like 1999 into the thousands, the first-person shooter genre sort of became the new darling of the industry. We saw, you know, countless first-person shooters. We started to see a little bit of like a different, differing trend with MMOs with World of Warcraft. But again, if we start talking about that, we'll be here until, you know, sometime tomorrow or next week. Because again, it's just such, each one of these topics is just a massive thing to digest. Yeah, I mean, I, I part of basically, I mean, the work that I've tried to do is is essentially to create a concise history of mm-hmm. mostly mainstream. Like I, I, I call myself a historian of game design, mm-hmm. um, and not games generally, game design. So I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not super interested in hardware, in, except in as much as it affects design. Yeah. Um, but the it's impossible to have a complete history of game design, right? There are too many fringe players, mm-hmm. um, especially after the Dungeons and Dragons boom. You know, there are so many tabletop um, yeah. organizations, conventions, players, genres that you could never hope to in- incorporate all of them into one theoretical history. So mm-hmm. the history that I've worked on has been mo- uh, entirely video games. I, although I, I have done some research on how Dungeons and Dragons influenced. Um, video game RPGs but if you the history that I talk about and to you know to narrow things down at least for our conversation is uh, entirely video games mostly mainstream and mm. mostly console mm. so yeah. Uh, yeah I mean the, when when I talk about when, when I say video game history everyone's going to go well he's not including this that or the other thing and you're right you're absolutely right I, I don't include everything I'm including sort of just the, the main line which leads from um Nishikado, the creator of Space Invaders, to Miyamoto, the, who mm-hmm. needs no introduction, <laughs> to essentially Half-Life and 
than beyond. And then we, I, I, my history peters out sometime in 2008 when we hit the indie era and, mm-hmm. you know, things come off the rails in a good way. Yeah, and that, again, is another topic in of itself and how the indie scene has really transformed, not, again, as we were saying earlier, not just in terms of making a game, but what is a video game? And hell, that last question, that's a good three-hour discussion if you get the right people together in a room. Or how can you study, I mean, even from 2004 when World of Warcraft came out, how can yeah. you study something which is still changing? Yeah. Like, what, what are you going to say about it? That's, is, it is what you're going to say about World of Warcraft or Minecraft still going to be true when mm-hmm. you, you publish what you write or two mm-hmm. years later? Yeah. I mean, it, again, we're definitely getting a little bit off tangent, but – like early access and as you were saying a few minutes ago Patrick regarding Kickstarter and crowdfunding these are they're really opening the doors to the transparency of game design and also influencing it with like stretch goals and things like that or even with the early access period a game that enters early access can be fundamentally different than when it leaves and it could leave in anywhere from two to three months two to three years and even beyond or uh, smaller than that. And it also makes it, I think, for you and for me, a lot harder to analyze these games. And again, it goes back to what I was saying with like the review scores. It's very hard to put like an official stamp on a game these days when the game could change in 6 to 12 months down the line. Exactly. Um, so that's – well, fortunately, I, I do not intend to bite off <laughs> that particular um, hunk of, of meat. Yeah, and for that just leaves it all for me to try and consume. <laughs> that, that's a lifetime's worth of work. Yeah. All right. Again, I feel we can easily just reminisce and talk for like the next four or five hours. But I know uh, we do have some of a time that we don't want to be here until midnight when it's possibly going to start thundering in our area. So we better at least start to move on and try to get somewhat on topic. Get our words down before the apocalypse, yes. Yeah. <laughs> before we actually start talk, breaking down the platform or the RPG genre first – um, you've already talked a little bit about your background, your history with studying game design, and sort of like that from a historian point of view. But also for people listening to this cast, Pat, as we said, you've also written several books. If you wouldn't mind, for people listening, what are some of the books that you've written over the years? So the I work on a book series. It's mm-hmm. called Re- Reverse Design. Mm-hmm. And the essential idea is that I want to do – Write book length works that reverse engineered the every design decision, every design decision that went into classic games. And I started with Final Fantasy VI, um, and I said, okay, what what made Final Fantasy VI the game it is? And I came up with a thesis, and I went through the whole book explaining how the cast of characters um, really sort of encircled the design of Final Fantasy VI. That the, everything else in the game serves. The player's ability to have any four characters in the main party uh, that they they want based on their liking or disliking of the preference. Like basically, do I like this character? Is this character's personality something I want I want to have? Like, because every character in the game has numerous optional dialogues that they will say if you have them in the party when an event happens, and you know the, the play. What the, the designers wanted to do was to give you know the player fourteen different characters with different personalities to play with and pick any four or pick all of them if you play through the game several times and see what it's like to go on an adventure with these characters that had real personalities Mm and, you know, fairly good writing for the time, especially. Um, And just just choose who you want, not based on preferences of I need a knight, um, I need a a mage, I need a monk, or, you know, I need a priest, and then I need a rogue. Like, so, you know, fighter, Mm -hmm. priest, mage, rogue is the classic balance and you know obviously things have gotten more complex over time in terms of yeah. class based compositions but uh, Final Fantasy VI essentially dispensed with character classes not entirely, the characters do have classes it's just those classes were less meaningful yeah. um, and so I talk about how that decision to get you know sort of diminish the value of uh, character classes affects everything else in the game you know when I went mm-hmm. in with did all these graphs, looked like even word things like word count like how many words does each character speak and what does that tell us mm-hmm. um, how many you know how, what, what's going on in dungeons how what, what's the average magic defense of uh, enemies and the dungeons of the, of the world of ruin and what does that show us about how the game gets harder um, mm-hmm. and you know looking back on it that was five years ago there 
are some flaws in that book. But you know, the first book. Final Fantasy VI was about twenty two thousand words, um, which was for the time was big. I mean, this is this is way before boss fight yeah. books ever started. <laughs> um, so you know, and before brick by brick, before um, uh, Critical Companion to Wario Land Four, before any of those things, and uh, so it was relatively small. And I, at the time, it was big, but I understand now that it was not huge. But and then I wrote the next book on Chrono Trigger, and that was a little bit longer. Um, sort of analyzing Chrono Trigger as a comedy and a tragedy, um, and how that, how you know, surprising and deceiving the player uh, yeah. worked into the design, and that's that's the book on Chrono Trigger. And then I got to the my, the third entry in the Reverse Design series, which is on Super Mario World, and mm. I thought that you know, going into it, okay, this will be <laughs> this will be the same length, right? I'll, I'll sit down, I'll spend six months writing this, and I'll knock it out because you know it, it's about the first two books took about. I would say about 600, 650 hours each, um, which, you know, at the time I was basically doing that full time. So I could turn to turn that out in, you know, about half a year um, if you don't include, you know, waiting for editing and uh, other things that came up. Um, and and six, so six months in, I could I could turn out a book like that. But then I, when I got started on Super Mario World, I realized that, uh, you know, there was some really profound things going on in the design of that game. And so I made my first attempt, my first sort of, attempt to climb the edifice of, of Mount Miyamoto ended in, in sort of disaster. I didn't publish any of that disaster, <laughs> uh, obviously, but it did teach me some really important things about thoroughness and what some of these books would need to be. So, and I, you know, I just, as you do something, you improve at it. That's, that's the nature of game design, right? Yeah. You get better at games as you play them. Well, you get better at game books as you write them. And, you know, uh, super reverse design, super Mario world ended up being this 65,000 word monster that took me, you know, a good 16 months um, to write, and probably somewhere between, you know, a, a thousand and 1200 hours to do. And, you know, I learned a tremendous amount, though. I, I learned, like, that, that Miyamoto had a design method that he employed for, you know, probably it evolved around 1990, in which he employed uh, right up until, I guess, Super Mario 64. He, he for a few games there that he, he worked with it. And then, which then sort of became revived. This this what I call CCST challenge for stands for challenge cadence skill theme. It's not super important to the discussion right now, but the Miyamoto style of design at, at its zenith was this incredible design philosophy that you could easily replicate in your own games. I mean, mm-hmm. the beauty of Miyamoto's design is that it's simple. It's not yeah. you know simple in the sense that oh it's it's so obvious. It's simple in the sense that if you follow the method, it'll take you places. It's it's a really mm-hmm. fascinating. Um, tool it's more like a tool than it is like a, a philosophy i guess you you use it and you create amazing things and each each artist using it will create his own unique vision but when miyamoto used it the the his real gift to us in super mario world was that he taught us how to make lots and lots of level content from a single method yeah uh, and that's what the book explains and but then it was you know sixty five thousand words and i'm like oh god <laughs> is this is this how long um is this how long all these rest of these books are going to be? So I, you know, I started the Half Life book, the re- Reverse Design Half Life, which is number four in the series, and you know, I just sort of I had to come at it. I said, well, I, I've set a standard with Super Mario World, and I I have to go mm-hmm. through with that standard. And sure enough, it was about fifty thousand words um, mm-hmm. shorter. I turned it t- turned it out a little bit slower than the Super Mario World book, but um, probably fewer hours overall, probably closer to just about a thousand hours, mm-hmm. and then. Um, because at the same time, one of the reasons why it's been slower though is because that I would take breaks from writing um, Reverse Design Half Life to write Reverse Design Final Fantasy VII, which is the book which is coming out um, probably at the end of September, depending on how editing and typesetting go. Mm-hmm. Um, which has been the most fun I've ever <laughs> had writing a book. But again, is another fifty thousand word monster um, as far as you know relative to how long game books are. I mean, if you look at you know. Um, the art of fun or something like that or the book of lenses you know they're they're not mm-hmm. super long um because you know it's good to be concise when you're writing about yeah. game design being too lengthy is that's 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 a task for other fields but sometimes you you got to say what you got to say and and that has been sort of the journey that I've been on with the books is as I have written about games I have discovered that there is more to say about them every time I write about them mm-hmm. that I can always go deeper and always find more yeah and, and- and that's that's been the most incredible lesson for me. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I found out with writing for Game Wisdom, that it, not only is there a lot to write about, but as you said, Pat, you also have to get really good at being able to still make it concise. 
And there's always that balance. I mean, if I look at some of the stuff I used to write like five, six years ago, I was like always approaching, you know, 1,800, 2,000 war oracle posts. And I realized I really wasn't saying a whole lot there. So I've been getting better at writing again, even no matter how great you are at writing, talking about game design it's almost impossible to do it in a short length or do it in a short length and still actually say something that matters. Yeah. And like, um, have you done anything with YouTube yet? Like making videos or stuff like that? I mean, I do have a, I do have a channel. Um, Mm -hmm. if you search the game design for me, it's all on the website. If you go to the game design forum.com, you can find the YouTube channel. And, uh, I, I definitely, um, I video is something I want to get more into, but it's something Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to have to wait until my next Kickstarter to, you know, see if I can uh, accrue some funds, which can allow me to maybe get some better software, maybe have some help. Because I'm not a great yeah. video maker. I, you know, I went to college yeah. to write, learn to learn how to write, and mm-hmm. you know, I came away with function. I'll just say functional writing skills that I can have good structure in a paper, and you know, mm-hmm. get a thesis and keep it going for an entire book. But you know, the the problem for me with um, being concise is not not that it's not that I wanted to say too much. Is that I would I could I could probably write you know. Uh, 2,000 words before I even realized what I was writing about. Mm-hmm. It's just trying to yeah. work my way into a game and, and it always, was always a, a kind of a grueling process to re- realize, okay, I need <laughs> to do this. Okay, here's this feature. Let's see, how do I tie it to this feature? And then, you know, and then 2,000 words in, I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm at the beginning. I'm going to delete <laughs> all these 2,000 words and I'm going to cut right to the point and now I understand where I'm going with game design because, you know, because like I said, there in you know, 2010, there was so little out there on game design and I think there's a lot more on game design now, but I think most of it is – not most of it, but the largest percent of, percentage of it, the majority of game design writing is this is what game design is like generally. This is how you design video games, capital V. And I don't learn from that very well because I think that the difference between – like I said earlier, the difference between you know, Final Fantasy and Mark of the Ninja is really <laughs> profound and yeah. you know, the difference between Mario Kart – and Call of Duty is just enormous. So um, there are things they have in common, but you know, it's just I. For me, it was always the reason why I started the Reverse Design series is that I need to study single games. I need yeah. to understand what did this game that I love do, um, mm-hmm. and that that's sort of been my project. And but yes, as you as you said, you know, you can really write a lot before you get to your point yeah. <laughs> because there hasn't <laughs> there hasn't been you know. You know, until people started very recently writing books about platformers, there's never been. You know, there isn't. We can't go back to 1990 and look up in the library um, these mm-hmm. ten books that were written by PhD students as they tried to discover what made platformers yeah. tick. That just didn't exist. Definitely, and uh, game preservation is also another major topic. I I assume that's one that you're also very much interested in, as someone who studies the history of video games and game design, and. That's another really good point. It's also getting harder to find these games, too. It sure and, is. And, I mean, hell, that's another two-hour topic easily, especially with the two of us on talking about it. Um, one thing that I wanted to uh, mention that I thought was kind of funny, like, and just in a way of thinking about writing, is I just love how, for your book series, that it can only be, like, one game per book, because I think it would probably drive you crazy to try and talk about two games in a single book. But it's also very interesting, the fact that you can get an entire book out of just one video game. And that's something that I think a lot of people, especially a lot of consumers, and maybe people don't really understand game development, may not realize that there's a lot more that goes into these games that you realize. And... What you were saying a few minutes ago regarding sort of Miyamoto's method and sort of like his like philosophy for designing these games. Like his games are like from the outside, they look very simple. They're meant to be something that, you know, anyone can pick up who has an interest in playing these games can learn. There's no, uh, you know, brutal difficulty sections. There's no five hour tutorials. They're very much a pick up and play game. Yeah. But getting the game to that state, that in of itself is a massive undertaking. Yeah, I mean, and and getting it big enough that it's really satisfying. Because I, I think there have been a few games of, you know, the indie type. Like, I think, uh, um, not this is an indie, but I mean, it started as an indie game, but a uh, mm-hmm. student project. But Portal mm-hmm. has a very much the streamlined feel of Super Mario World. But And I loved it. But, it, you know, I didn't feel like it was as big as Super Mario World, which preceded it by, you know, what, 16 years? Mm-hmm. Um, 
Portal was Portal was probably the first game that I that wasn't designed by Miyamoto that I felt like could have been a Miyamoto game. Hmm. But think think how long it took them to get yeah. to you know, and it wasn't because Portal was a platformer because it's not just a platform; it's a platformer first person shooter, right? Slash puzzle too. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, although I, puzzle is a hot button word for me these oh, days, yeah. I think puzzle can mean anything, and but yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a topic for a separate <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, like. It not it wasn't just that it was a platform. It was that the the elegance and the 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 difficulty curve and the feeling of being totally like I need to solve this and I know I can. I feel like I can solve mm-hmm. this and I, I feel like I've learned everything I need to know. Um, that was, Portal was the first time I felt like that since Yoshi's Island, mm. um, probably. And uh, yeah. I think you know that so you know six I guess sixteen years from Super Mario World, the game that I think did it you know was the first one to really nail the Miyamoto style like it was the mature Miyamoto style emerging for the first time uh, people you know lively go on about Super Mario Bros. 3 and I think Super Mario Bros. 3 is a great game mm-hmm. um, but I think it's a little bit wild it's sort of like uh, the art house days of uh, <laughs> of, uh, of a director um, you know mm-hmm. Miyamoto was doing something a little he was a little bit like he was being experimental which I, he needed to do and which still resulted in some amazing levels mm-hmm. in that game but which nevertheless also resulted in some head scratchers um, yeah but to get from 1990 to like I don't I'm not remembering Portal came out in probably 2007 I think does that sound right I think it may have been older because I think it was part of the orange box so I think yeah. that was I think that could have been 2006 2007 so it was after Half Life too so it was at least yeah. 14 15 years um, yeah. <laughs> and you know just but how long did it take for someone to grow up with Miyamoto and be able to emulate him and on in, not in the same country not in the same continent you know not in the same generation like just mm-hmm. very far removed. I think that speaks a lot to, you know, what those games meant and, and the what it means to get something from a game. Like you could study Super Mario World. I could go back and write easily right now ten thousand more words about Super Mario World mm-hmm. since I stopped writing about it, you know, in, in twenty fourteen, because I realized more things about it that are incredible. And that's that's what's so glorious about the Miyamoto style, is that he there's it's very simple to begin and yet there's so much elegance. Um underlying it that you could yeah. go on for almost forever yeah and it seems like we've sort of um, organically transitioned into focusing on the platformer genre first and another part of that i i'm curious to get what your thoughts on this patrick one like the most surprising things that sort of really help also helped me really appreciate miyamoto's design sort of nintendo's own like style would have been super mario maker which came out last year and I talked about last year, and for the few of you who don't know what that is, that is, of course, the uh, – I guess it really is a, a level editor that you can use to make your own Mario levels in different styles, themes. And it's really amazing to me when I play a level in that from someone who isn't, like, from Nintendo. And, like, again, as you were saying, Patrick, like, Miyamoto's style really does – it can really be seen in his games. There is that sense that you can sort of see his guiding hand and how these games are designed and developed. So when I play like the Super Mario levels that don't work for me, I can sort of see where things are different. And I made a post about this, I think, last year about lessons that I've learned about game design from Mario Maker. Because it's one of those things that it's very hard to put into words, like what Nintendo did so right with classic Mario games until you see someone else, you know, try their own hand at it. And I mean, that is just a very fascinating topic and really does sort of get the heart of the challenges of making a great platformer. Yeah, I mean, it really does. And I, I actually, once Mario Maker came out, someone, I mean, there was a website, um, Toots Plus, that commissioned me to write and make levels about it's based on my my book um mm-hmm. the reverse design super mario world they were like hey you want to do some mario, mario maker levels and post them on our site and show people what you mean and uh, i mean the timing couldn't have been better right right, mm-hmm. right after yeah. well, it's like four months after i released my book here comes mario maker and uh boy that drove that really helped because <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah. l- l- as you know the, the the audience for game intense game design writing like very deep dive is is niche mm-hmm. um and you know i i which was hoping to make more money on the books than I do. Um, although who, who doesn't say that about their yeah. job, right? <laughs> but uh, um, that really helped a lot just to, just to make, you know, let people know, hey, hey, by the way, you want to design like, you know, the levels you loved as a kid? Well, here's, here's a method. 
Um, and I always tell people, I don't, I'm not trying to like talk myself up because it's not my method. It's Miyamoto's method. He just didn't tell us except in the form of game. He, he told us in a game, I'm trying to tell you in English because that's mm-hmm. you know not even the language that he speaks. Um, but yeah, that was a, re- a real boon was Mario Maker. And uh, you know, I, I, I wish the Mario Maker tools were a little bit more robust, but I'm delighted that they exist because yes. the notion that people could learn level design – well, um, which you know they, this wasn't true for a long time, but the notion that they could learn level design from Super Mario World or something like Super Mario World, obviously there's more multiple settings in mm-hmm. instead of Half Life is great because because I feel like that the level design boom happened in uh, Half Life mods, like it was all Half Life and Doom mods. People, were, oh okay, I'm going to become a game designer, so I'm going to make some Quake Three arenas, and mm-hmm. that'll that'll get me a job making levels at some other new, you know game company and then I'll move on to my own designs and I think that path was blazed by a lot of people and you know I'm really glad it worked for them um, I'm trying to think there's a, a Doom 2 designer um, who made like all these kinds of maps for the Doom 2 like master level set and then for free and then got noticed by Valve and was hired by them and is now like an executive at Valve um, and that's, that's an incredible success story, but I want to see that success story play out with Mario Maker. I want to see someone make incredible Mario Maker levels mm-hmm. and then go on to become a famous game designer. Like that, to me, that would be the greatest delight. Um, mm-hmm. I would love to see that, that, that play out. Yeah. And it's, again, it's kind of interesting, again, to track sort of how a lot of developers have really got their start. I mean, as you were just saying, Pat, regarding like the mod making scene, that was like during the thousands. It seemed like everyone who created a mod, like they would start to slowly, they would either become adopted by a major studio or they would try to form their own game. And like a really good example of that recently would be Long War Studios, who um, I'm, I'm not sure if you follow who Long War was. Do you know who they are? I'm afraid I don't actually, but maybe I'll know their game. Uh, Long War Studios was a mod team who created the Long War mod for XCOM Enemy. I always get the two Enemy Unknown. There, yeah, Enemy Unknown. That's the most recent one, yeah. And they basically, again, they learn how to design a game. They learn how to do this all by working on this mod, which was a complete. uh, It was almost like a partial, total conversion, if that makes sense, of XCOM Enemy Unknown. They just completely. They basically took it apart. And put it back together again with new features, new maps, new complexities. And it was so big. It was so popular. And they didn't even charge for it. It was simply like their pet project. It basically gave them the notoriety to form their own studios, which I believe at this moment they are working on perhaps their first Kickstarter project. Basically their own property in a similar Long War kind of way. And Firaxis even commissioned them to make mods for XCOM 2. And all this started because they wanted to basically tinker with the XCOM model at the time. Yeah, and that, that's a, that's really cool. But that is an example of like, well, I mean, I guess XCOM is not, you know, Half Life, thank God. But um, <laughs> you know, it's it's somebody doing something different. But it is a, in the um, shoot things genre, right? Um, and you know, mods, you know, in, in between, you know, ninety eight and. 2008 were very shoot heavy yeah um and i I don't that doesn't bother me like philosophically but i it just means i'm excited to see mods that are jump heavy and you know you see some of that with indie stuff like there are a lot of high precision platformers that came out between Mm -hmm. uh 2009 and 2013 um that i've admired but i'm still excited to see uh more of that like someone coming up organically who said you know i i got started with mario maker that's gonna be that's gonna be great i think yeah, man, I need to get back to Mario Maker. I I did like a few levels of it like last year, and then I sort of got really busy with the site. But I haven't looked at it since they did like their major update. They added in checkpoints, stuff like that. So I think I want to try to get back in there and get my put my um, hand, I guess, back into the ring or get back into the ring of making some of those levels because it is fascinating. I think what's really amazing about Mario Maker is the fact that it is a very comprehensive tool. I think, as you said, Pat, I agree with you that it could be more involved. It could add more elements to it. But as something for someone who has no programming expertise or for like students or people who are interested in just making levels while having to learn a programming language, it is a very brilliant piece of software on that front. Yeah, it's very welcoming. I'll say that. Um, yeah. You know, like I, just, I, I wish that the, you know, there were, some of the things that existed in Super Mario World, they're not 
I wish mm-hmm. they would show up in, in Mario yeah. Maker and they're, they're not. That's, that's, you know, there's time and people will find workarounds and it's, it, I'm sure it'll, you know, it'll still be great. So I'm not trying yeah. to complain. I just, you know, I wish that the, the, the things that I love about Mario World, Super Mario World were available. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if Nintendo were smart, I would hope that they would continue supporting Mario Maker for, you know, as long as they're really able to. Because I think it is not just a fascinating game, but it's definitely something I think you need to get in the hands of more people, especially students, too. I agree completely. I, I You know, I think Unity, obviously, is what's in every university right now, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they they really should be considering Mario Maker as like maybe not maybe not a university thing but like a high school thing, right? Yeah. Now, talking about platform the platforming genre from a more generalized point of view, I'm curious about what your thoughts are going to be on this topic, Pat. Regarding platforms, as you said, there is a big jump in terms of indie platformers, like from like 2009, 2013, again, with stuff like Braid, Super Meat Boy, and even even more niche things, such as the I Wanna Be That Guy series. Or like They Bleed Pixels and stuff, yeah. Yeah. So, my question for you, and again, this is, I think, will be a very interesting discussion, considering what you've done in terms of research with Miyamoto's method and the Mario series, but... What do you think of, uh, like, I'm not sure how probably um, define this, but the super expert level of platformers, the ones that basically demand pixel perfection, there's only one way to get through it. If you don't do it like X, Y, Z, you're going to die every time. So again, like the I want to be that guy thing uh, or and like that high level. Like when you put those games or you look at them next to something like Super Mario World or Brothers 3, what do you think of the platforming genre at like that level? You know, I mean like that was a niche that was underserved during the Miyamoto mm-hmm. reign like So having super hard platformers I think is a perfectly acceptable thing to do and I think indie scene is the perfect place to do it because you know that's you, the risk is low the audience is niche you can find you, you and the audience can find each other and they can you know you can make a relatively mm-hmm. cheap but very difficult game like super meat boy that's um you know people there's going to be people out there who are going to say super meat boy isn't really difficult and okay <laughs> it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder but relative to super mario world it is a very diff- mm-hmm. difficult game yeah and although i think it's very elegantly designed as well like i i, I see many of the things um, I mean, I don't see a lot of Super Mario World and Super Meat Boy. I see a lot of Super Mario Brothers three and Super Meat Boy. Mm-hmm. I think it it takes a different historical track. It says, okay, well, what if this didn't happen? It's sort of a alternate history of platformers. What if what mm-hmm. if we never got to Super Mario World? What if instead, you know, the game that Super Mario Brothers three was had been it? And what mm-hmm. would have happened in history if that had been the case? And that's basically what they did. And I, so I still see a lot of Miyamoto in the game taken mm-hmm. to a very extreme level. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm glad they did it. I'm really pleased that they could do something like that. I'm, I'm glad that there's a space for that in our in our um, marketplace now. And I, I'm glad that there's a distribution system like Steam that can be yeah. used to find the players who want to play that and to reduce the overhead so that people can make the kinds of artistic statements they want to make in platformers. Um, nothing pleases me more than to, to for people to be able to make uh, really artistically bold games um, mm-hmm. that really – that makes me very happy as far as, you know, how I feel about um, the game industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, uh, continuing on that, especially with that, the divide between like that, those kinds of difficulty challenges, we see a lot of that with Super Mario Maker as well. There's been a lot of, I guess, quote unquote, troll levels that have become popular, you know, like invisible blocks designed literally so that they're placed exactly where you would want to jump to basically kill you like the first time you could try and get through each level and i'm just wondering pat for you like do you consider that like as something like like as a part of good platformer design do you think it's good bad or just simply like like a different slice of it i don't like troll levels myself if people mm-hmm. want to play them and if people want to play them then then fine i have no problem with them existing i just mm-hmm. i don't see them as being what Miyamoto was about mm-hmm. um, because Miyamoto was about accessibility. And even though you can like, I mean, even Donkey Kong country was basically a Miyamoto, Miyamoto style game, taking mm-hmm. it to a more difficult level. They mm-hmm. took the basic Miyamoto formula. They ran with it. They ran deeper with it. Um, mm-hmm. And then other games have run deeper still. 
and they run into the most extreme, like, you know, de- depths of difficulty. And that's fine for me, but I don't think that memorization mm-hmm. is like levels you have to memorize and know how to execute perfectly are a part of that tradition. Yeah. I think if you want to, if you want to play them, like, that's fine. I, but I, I don't, I don't find memorization instead of, you know, fluid understanding of levels yeah. to be something that I'm interested in. But again, I, I don't, I don't like to be, be prescriptive. Mm-hmm. Um, about what kind of games can exist. If you want to play them, I hope someone makes them. Yeah, and I think I agree with you, at least in terms of my own personal preference, that I prefer to play levels where you can see that organic flow to it. That's not just about memorization, but it's about figuring out, okay, here comes the uh, moving platform section. Now, based on how they're moving, I need to do this, this, and this. Right, it's, or the, it's it, not even it's not even explicit in your mind. You just understand deeply what you're you looking at, yeah. kind of. Yeah, I and mean, that's one of the things I really have loved about, especially like the recent 3D Mario games. Like I consider Mario Galaxy One and Two to be some of my favorite games of all time from a, a game design and a level design point of view. Yeah, I mean, I to me, I, I've said this before in print um, that uh, that's the moment where you know Mario games recovered their the Miyamoto style like I think it was sort of sort of wandered off a little bit there in Mario 64 when they had to contend with the you know the impact of 3D then they had to resort to different organizational methods as they sort of found their legs but uh, mm-hmm. and through Mario Sunshine but I feel like Galaxies where they like oh, okay this is how we get back to that that CCST count, challenge cadence skill theme and how we mm-hmm. can organize levels like we used to organize them. Or really, it's different people making the games, but how we can organize levels like our forebears organize them and mm-hmm. make game design accessible again. Um, but yeah. in a gigantic 3D landscape with much better technology, I feel like they recaptured their heritage there. And, and I yeah. agree pretty completely with that. I think what's also very fascinating, again, like sticking with Nintendo and Miyamoto's method, is what happens at like the end of these Mario games, especially like not just a modern one of the galaxy, but older ones like Super Mario World. Like, when you get to, like, the bonus levels or the uh, extra challenges things, and you really see sort of, like, the gloves coming off, it's really fascinating to see, like, how Nintendo and Miyamoto takes these designs to their most challenging state. Like, I'm talking, like, the bonus world of Super Mario World, Galaxies. I mean, as a recent example, Super Mario 3D World, the final, final, final level, you know, the one all the way at the end of the bonus world, I still haven't managed to crack that yet. And it's kind of weird to say that because a lot of people assume, like, what we were saying a few minutes ago with Nintendo and Mario, a lot of people see these games as being very simplistic, you know, they're you know, meant for, quote-unquote, the kids. But when you see, like, again, like, the apex of their design, it really becomes, I think, its own other thing. So I was just wondering, uh, what do you think about, like, when we see the expert side of Miyamoto's method? I mean, it's always existed. If like mm-hmm. the real Super Mario Brothers two or the Lost Levels, yeah, you know, shows that. Um, and I, th- I really like having ultra difficult modes and things like that, extra challenge layers that are not mandatory that are optional. I think that's mm-hmm. the best way to handle it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's definitely, I think, if I were going to make a platformer, I would make a platformer that has you know your your co- main game content, mm-hmm. and then you have like much more difficult options that you can fly off to. And I think Mm -hmm. for me, that's, that's the legacy of Miyamoto right there is, you know, accessibility and then excellence beyond that. If you so desire, it's sort of like, um, the influence of optional dungeons from RPGs on, you know, on mainstream video game design. So I I like that a lot. Um, I, and I feel ultra hard content has absolutely has its place in any genre. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a matter of where it is. Like if it's, Mm -hmm. you know, you have, you know, you have eight levels in a game, or eight worlds in a game, and World Six is the hardest one. You messed up. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> like, and that's that happens in some mm-hmm. games. Like, there's like, oh, this they'll just the players will just learn this skill, and then they'll be able to master all this other stuff. It's like you better be sure that they master mm-hmm. that skill. Um, you better be sure that that's not incredibly hard for everyone except you. Um, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a problem in some of the more recent ultra difficult games. So like. Oh, by the way, you know, uh, half the players that you have out here now are stumbling over this one skill that you thought would be easy. So maybe you needed to be a little more careful about how you cycle through your content and, you know, yeah. where your difficulty is. Yeah, and that's another, I mean, hell, we could even uh, 
narrowing our focus down, we could spend like two, three hours just talking about uh, Miyamoto's design and sort of like that philosophy of Nintendo. And I agree with you about that, Pat, that that pacing, especially with gating difficulty and complexity, is such a challenging topic. And not just with platformers, but with any game design that you can think of, there is that challenge. Like recently I spoke with Plastic Games, who are making an action strategy game called Bit Shifter. And it's like that same thing. Whenever you're trying to introduce new mechanics to the player, it's very challenging to get that pacing right. Do I go, if I go too fast, then the game's going to be exciting, but what if players don't learn this? But at the same time, if I go too slow, then players are going to get bored and they're not going to want to stick around for when, you know, the gloves come off. And that that middle ground is such a very difficult part and it's also a very abstract element and again as someone who studied Miyamoto studied Super Mario World I think you can attest to sort of like how much like philosophical or abstract natures there are that go into making these great games I mean yeah the the, the Super Mario World book that I wrote basically describes how you get from easy to hard Mm -hmm. um in levels and across the course of the games, I, I basically I wanted to say, okay, if you were gonna you know make us ultra hard Super Mario World, this is how you'd get there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, these these are the tools. Here's the toolkit. Um, that's something I definitely wanted to do, and I think you could do it with that. I mean, um, mm-hmm. people have told me that they're using the the lessons they learned in in the Super Mario World book to make games. And again, I want to say that I'm not trying to give myself too much credit. They are Miyamoto's lessons. I I mm-hmm. just am um, I'm a stepping stone <laughs> for you to reach him. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, that's that's really great. I hope I'm, I'm really eager to see what happens with those because you know it's a it's a long game development cycle. So mm-hmm. we'll find out later. But uh, you know, the tools are there, um, and that's something I wanted. I wanted. I mean, the idea of basically the the, the simplest version of the way, way of describing the platformer book is um, the, the Super Mario World book is if you look at you know a basic idea in a Super Mario World level, mm-hmm. and then you look at how it becomes more complicated over time. There are discernible and repeating patterns. Yeah. So you can see how X evolves into Y and Y evolves into Z, and how mm-hmm. you know things get further apart and change speed and change their behaviors, and what jumps are more difficult than others, and what environments you know cause what behavior, and you can really track. Yeah. A very definitely. linear relationship to all. If you the understanding from point A to point B to point C all throughout the game, um, you can really see in what I call skill themes, which is the highest level of organization that like, okay, this is, you know, there are, I think, I, I don't remember the count exactly, there are 14 levels that are about moving platforms and there are, you know, 10 levels which are about um, moving enemies. Um, there's a little bit of overlap and there are, you know, uh, 11 levels which are about moving as fast as possible and there are 12 levels which are about um, dodging flying enemies. Um, and that's how those are the, the four skill themes. You know, that's not what their official names are, but those are the four skill themes in Super Mario World. And you can divide the content into four and say, okay, most of the levels fit into one of these categories. And now let's look at how each category evolves across the course of the game and how mm-hmm. the game cycles through them. So you have a framework, sort of a, a scaffold that you can then use to build something in the manner of Super Mario World if you want to do that. I mean, I understand that's not for everybody. It's not. I don't mm-hmm. think that all games should be like Super Mario World. I don't want to restrict game design styles. But if you that's part of the journey that you want to take as you know as a game designer if you want to you know go work through your influences um hopefully that book would allow you to do that. That's that's the goal mm-hmm. at least. Yeah. And talking about breaking down the level design and again about that uh the proper gating or escalating the difficulty it's part it reminds you of a post that i wrote a few years ago talking about this concept of subjective difficulty right and how difficult yeah yeah and again like how a lot of what you see in mario can also be translated into a game like demon souls which obviously demon souls is not a platformer but that sense of gating the design, testing the player on basic elements, and then growing that over the course of, you know, it could be five to ten hour game, could be less, could be more. And again, seeing how things track across that, how new things are introduced in such a way that it becomes logical and organic. As you were saying with Super Mario World, 
We can say the same thing about Super Mario Galaxy. The very first levels of the game, yes, you have all these options open to you in terms of, you know, the triple jump, wall jump into a spin jump, etc. But the game is explicitly testing and asking the player to do just, you know, run and jump. That's it. You're, the, the first level of Mario game is not going to test you to do a triple wall jump into a spin jump to get up to, like, grab a hidden object or to get a main objective. And so what they do over the course of the game is, as you said, they introduce these new themes where they start introducing the variances on these basic mechanics. So let's say a few levels in, now the game's going to ask you, now, okay, do a running jump. Okay, you've done that. A few more levels now. Now try a wall jump, just a basic wall jump off a platform. And then over the course of playing, the player builds up their... Uh, build up the blueprints or the schemas for how to do all this stuff so that when we get to the final level and the games asks you okay now i want you to do a triple jump spin we'll come with a fancy title for that later the player is not going to look at that and scratch their heads they're going to use everything they've learned to organically basically put that together in you know, this most evolved state. So the game doesn't explicitly tell you how to do this, but it tells you all the steps and asks you to basically draw that line from X to Y to Z in your head. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I really noticed, which I think fits the pattern of what you're describing, is um, that the floor and the, the sort of flo- difficulty floor rises, but it's mm-hmm. the distance between the difficulty floor and the difficulty ceiling in any given level are always is always the same. Like, mm-hmm. if, you know, I'm going to make up numbers right here, but just to illustrate, but like, if you walk into the level and it's a difficulty two at the beginning, it's only ever going to be a difficulty six at the end. And mm-hmm. whereas, you know, if you walk into the level, it's a difficulty eight, it's only going to be a difficulty 12 at the end. You know, there's, there's, mm-hmm. it's the, the maximum chain Delta difficulty would be four in a, mm-hmm. in a Nintendo game. There's yeah. not, they're not going to, they're not going to ramp things up too much. And I, that's, that's a big part of the style. I think, and mm-hmm. what you're talking about gating, like, I think they've always aimed for that. I think yeah. that's really and a really important lesson to learn from Nintendo games or or Dark Souls, although I think Dark Souls is a little steeper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but that's still an idea that they employ, right? That there mm-hmm. shouldn't be too big a discrepancy between how you where you start and where this quest or level finishes. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go if it gets too steep or if it's bumpy, like you, you go you start at a four and you and the middle is a twelve and then you're back mm-hmm. down to a six at the end, yeah. you know, that level is inappropriately structured. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, 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 that's that gating, the idea of gating, you know, it seems nebulous, but it's not really as nebulous, nebulous as you think. There are definitely mm-hmm. guidelines that are outlined in classic games, which show you how to do it. Yeah. And like with Mario and even again, like with like Demon's Souls or Dark Souls, as you said, like when the difficulty works right, it just is like an organic growth. The player doesn't really sense that the game or doesn't really see the game getting difficult because their skills are just growing with the level. It's basically keeping pace with that, with the player's own skill. And as we were saying a few minutes ago, with like the ultra hard stuff, some of the genius of Nintendo, and even we see in some indie titles, is being able to, at the same time, accommodate those experts. And as I wrote in my post with Super Mario Galaxy, as we were just saying, the level designs from like the difficulty floor is always kept more on the low end. Again, it slowly rises. But an extra player will blaze through that, you know, they can do with their eyes closed, essentially. But then Nintendo always gives, like, other things in that level for those extra players, like the um, red coin challenges in Super Mario 64. Yeah, that's something I wish I had written more about, but Mm -hmm. we'll hopefully write about in a future (laughs) book. Yeah. And again, like, these are things that a normal player is not going to be focused on that. They're not going to care about getting 100 coins in Super Mario 64, getting the red coins, finding, like, um, I think in Super Mario Galaxy 2 or in 3D World, they had, like, the star coins you could find on each level. And those things, they're not going to be interested in. They're not even going to be even considering that because they're still learning it. But the option is there from the minute from the first minute for an extra player to go after that stuff. So they're being a gauge at a different level than the novice players. But the point is everyone is being engaged. No, you, The extra players don't have to wait until World 6 to get star coins unlocked. At the same time, the novice players aren't going to be thrown into that. As you were saying, like if someone makes World 6 the hardest world of a 12-world game... 
there's a problem there that the gating and the pacing is not right. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's a topic. That idea of um, you know extension challenges, like mm-hmm. uh, challenges which are very difficult but can be don't have to be engaged in, is something I haven't really written about. Although I think mm-hmm. you know there's a I would like to write eventually. It's not funded yet, but I would like to write mm-hmm. a reverse design on Yoshi's Island, which has which was sort of the beginning of that trend, mm-hmm. right? That was the sort of the first game to really say, oh, by the way, over here. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that you could have done in that same level if you took the time. You can go back to the level and go deeper. Yeah, um, and, and that's something I'd love to write about, but you know, well, that's mm-hmm. way off in the future right now. Yeah, and like, and I think another major part of that is there has to be something like there. There has to be a carrot that you can dangle from the player. So it's not just saying, "Oh, we're going to make it super hard," but you know. There's no point. Like we're not going to give you anything for it. And one thing that's been really good about Mario games is the fact there's always that reward. And you know the special world or the bonus levels to say, oh, you you're mastering the game. Great. Well, we have something really amazing way over there. But you know you have to you know earn it. You have to prove that you can handle it. Yeah, I miss that. That's not. I think because of AAA development getting so expensive, Mm -hmm. not a lot of games do that anymore. They can't say. Well, you know, like, I think back in the day, a level used to cost maybe, you know, $10,000 to make it at the, at the high mm-hmm. side or, you know, maybe just a $1,000 to make a level um, mm-hmm. in terms of manpower hours and resources used. Whereas now it might cost, you know, $150,000 to make a level in a shooter, like a AAA shooter. So they don't say, oh, there's bonus levels because bonus levels like what? We're going to spend $150,000 on this and then we're not mm-hmm. going to put it in the game for everybody. <laughs> it's not going to be able to for reviewers to see it. So, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I miss that. Hidden yeah. content. I, I like that a lot. Although yeah. I, I admit that some of that was destroyed by the, your ability to – the player's ability to sit on the couch with their, their tablet or phone and Google all of the secrets. Like that does mm-hmm. spoil some things yeah. to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, it's one of the things I still really like about Nintendo games. Again, like having that stuff in the game – but it's not getting in the way of the main game. So if someone doesn't want to do that or they're not skilled enough, it won't really be in their mind or they won't be able to access it. But as someone who knows how to play Mario games, I can see right away, oh, there's star coins here. There must be something big that I can go for. And again, if I want to go for that, I can see basically Nintendo taking the gloves off and you know kicking my ass with some crazy platforming levels. But I know that, you know, a six, seven-year-old kid who gets easily frustrated, they're not going to have to, that's not going to be basically shoved in front of their face. It's there if I want it, but it's not the point of focus for the game. Yeah, I mean, like that, uh, a pre, like uh, appealing to, you know, viewers on multiple levels is something that has been cherished in art mm-hmm. for a long time. Like you think about like a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, which you can read as a child and get it on one level and then read it as an adult and get it on a completely different level. That's an aesthetic that's been, you know, cherished by cherished about art for many centuries, and mm-hmm. I think that you know having that be present in video games too is is great. I think that's you know if we're going to be if we want to develop the art form of game design, then I think that that's something we really ought to have in games. Um, I don't know whether you know software development methods and you know uh, easily searchable wikis sometimes hurt that, but you know it's it's some it's an aesthetic that I don't want to lose. In, mm-hmm. in modern games, because I saw it a lot more back in, you know, say the 90s. Oh, right. Um, to just frame things, we've been talking for over an hour now. I mean, again, as, as you can certainly attest to with writing uh, your book, I mean, we can easily spend who knows how many hours just breaking down one game, let alone an entire genre. So in the hope of trying to... To keep this from going over two hours, I think uh, let's move on and I think talk and sort of shift gears and talk about RPG design. Before we do that, though, do you have any like final thoughts or a topic or trend about platforming that you want to mention or bring up now that we haven't touched on? I mean, any single topic that's more important and stands out, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, You know, I, I think that. Go back and play your old platformers, um, <laughs> and you'll you'll learn a lot about game design. Um, 
And like, mm-hmm. if you play Super, this is this is my, I'm going to show my bias here. If you go back and play your Super Mario games, you're going to learn a lot about what was great and what still matters in game design and what was has been relevant from the beginning to the end. And if you go back and play your old Sonic games, you're going to realize, holy crap, how did I enjoy this? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my opinion. I understand other people disagree, and that's fine. I'm not trying to like I said, I, I don't like to be proscriptive. So, mm-hmm. um, but there's still a lot that you can be you can dig out of your your old platformers. So yeah. do enjoy them. I may have to agree with you to some extent with at least with Sonic CD, which I replayed last week. And like about halfway through, like that feeling of dread was coming over me going, oh my God, I still have to play this. <laughs> and and I didn't get that about the older Sonic games, but I think that's sort of been like, like the quote unquote Nintendo magic that their game designs just really hold up. And whether it's because of just like, on a surface level, they have a clean aesthetic or they're easy to get into. Or if we go deeper and talk more about Miyamoto's method, there's just something about these Mario games that hold up. Like, I think you made a really good point there. I mean, I could right now go into my room, load up Super Mario World, and probably enjoy it as much or even more so than when I played it back in 1991. Yeah, and I, I think that's the sign of something that's really aged well. Yeah, I think that's 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 the real delight. So, um, but yeah, I, I do think we should probably move off of them because I, I if I get involved in another discussion about platform aesthetics, mm-hmm. I'll just keep going forever. Yeah, and um, I have a feeling that I've been saying this a lot more. For those of you listening to these casts, you can probably start a drinking game of every time I say that we give an estimate for a time for these casts, and we always go over. And I have a feeling that we could probably. Be, this could be like five to six hours of discussing easily on any one of these topics. So um, let's move on. But I know I usually say this to the end of the cast, but I would really love to have you back on, Pat, for help. We insert a topic. We could easily spend an hour, hour and a half on it easily. I I, I certainly – well, as having written five books now, I mm-hmm. you know, the fifth one coming out, I, I certainly don't lack for things to say. Mm-hmm. Whether I can say them in a way that you know people get something out of, that's the trouble. So yeah. we'll find out though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's move on to our next topic. We'll try to spend uh, – you know, fingers crossed, maybe 20, 30 minutes on it, but – at this point, who knows? Well, uh, for those of you listening, I promise we'll try to keep this under two hours if we can help it. But let's talk at least somewhat briefly about the RPG genre. And that is another genre that really has been around since the early days of the industry. It's also fascinating in its own way. I'm sure, Pat, you can agree with me on this, that it's one of those genres that has really split itself into different designs and different philosophies. Um, I think everyone knows what we're going to talk about or what I'm bringing up here, but there's, of course, the classic uh, computer or CRPG genre versus JRPG design, and how despite them both being RPGs, there are a lot of major differences when we start breaking them down at the design and mechanic level. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that the the differentiation in RPGs is a major theme. Um, something I'm writing, I wrote a lot about for the, the upcoming Final Fantasy VII book because I wanted to track how do we get from Final, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, the first RPG yeah. in 1974, to Final Fantasy VII, which is ostensibly in the same genre, but which is way, way different. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you make that journey? How do you explain that? Especially when people say, well, you know, Final you know, oh, I'm not. And, you know, I'm not talking about a JRPG. I'm talking about an RPG. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> is, is there meaning? Is there a meaningful difference? And I, I contend yes. I mean, to give a little bit of preview of the book, um, mm-hmm. I think they're not. There's not. I don't divide RPGs into PC and console because I don't. I think, especially with the release of things like, you know, Skyrim and and Dark Souls on the console, uh, that distinction is becoming less meaningful. But also. I, I don't think that you know designers intended the console to be different than the PC or that they had a goal of doing something different from what they saw on PCs, but rather that I, from my theory of it is that everyone was contending with the influence of Dungeons and Dragons and that if you look at what Dungeons and Dragons did, like the sort of explosion of creativity that came out of that game, by 19, probably 1981, 1982, 
Dungeons and Dragons had done almost, and this is a very controversial statement, and I understand it. If you want to come at me on the internet about this, you can certainly find me. The I guess uh, Josh has told me he's going to link this in the um, <laughs> my Twitter bio um, in in the comments to this this podcast. And you're certainly welcome to debate me on this because uh, I understand how controversial it is. But I think that by the mid '80s, um, Dungeons and Dragons had done everything that a pure RPG could do. Mm-hmm. That that you were not going to have an RPG that existed which was not simply repeating something Dungeons and Dragons had already done once. Not necessarily mm-hmm. done well. Mm-hmm. AD and D was a mess, just a hot, ugly mm-hmm. mess. But it was also incredibly rich in ideas. It was sort of like, you know, like uh, the explosion of Krakatoa or something that like just flinging, uh, you know, uh, uh, diamonds everywhere. You know, it, it was had gems in there, but it was also just a disaster in terms of organization. Um, nevertheless, you know, designers who wanted to mine that that mm-hmm. that. You know the the resources in D AD and D had a great time, but they had a trouble. It's like how do I not how am I not repeating D and D? And so mm-hmm. the three things that I, I I split RPGs down into three schools: mm-hmm. um, the simplification school, which is um, RPGs which are like Dungeons and Dragons in scope, essentially trying to do what Dungeons and Dragons did, mm-hmm. um, and you know, but simplifying many of the things that exist in Dungeons and Dragons, whether yeah. it's rules, like rule sets. Okay. Okay. This Thacko thing is not working at all. Let's try and come up with something better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's a simplification, but another simplification is, okay, I don't have a human DM. I cannot have these NPCs say literally anything. So I need to simplify the options of what an NPC can say. And so you end up in a simplification with games like Ultima, Wizardry, uh, Might and Magic, The Bard's Tale. Um, all those games, I think, are – and even Final Fantasy I is basically a, a, a simplification in that it tries to do what D&D did, um, and, but it has to drop some things in order to be feasible in a digital format. Uh, and But those games are always striving towards a more D&D-like experience until they culminate in something like uh, Baldur's Gate, which is about as D&D as you can get without having human DMs operating on the other side of a server. Um and then the second school of, of of RPG design that you know tries to free itself from not repeating D and D is the combination school. So combining RPGs with other genres, and you get the action RPG, you get the shooter RPG, you get you yeah. know the sim build RPG, game that, which produces games like Legend of Zelda, um, Minecraft, uh, call, the new Call of Duty games, Deus Ex, uh, Fallout. Mm-hmm. Fallout, which Fallout actually encompasses literally all of the things that I just talked about. <laughs> the new Fallout yeah. does. The Omni game it, it has become. Um, so you, if you combine uh, an RPG with an action game, uh, you don't, you're not like D&D anymore. You yeah. have to worry about execution rather than simply planning and, and thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you, – you don't have to worry about repeating anything because there are so, much, so many action mechanics out there. You know, and literally anything that has ever been, you know, in a platformer or a sh- shooter or hack and slash game can be combined with an RPG, and yeah. voila, you've got yourself something new. Not necessarily good, but you've got yourself something new. Yeah. Um, and then the third school of RPG design, which I'm sort of tracked, which leads to Final Fantasy VII, is the specialization school, mm. um, which is okay. We can't be D and D. It's impossible. I mean, or at least you know, it's it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And other people have already done it, right? Ultima mm-hmm. came really close. Baldur's Gate came probably even closer, you know. W- and and there's D and D still exists. It's not like D and D stopped existing. So people are going to have a better time playing D and D when it's actual D and D with human players than they are playing a video game. Mm-hmm. So what if we drop all that? What if we just take a few ideas from D and D and just experiment with those? Just have the whole game be about those. And the first game to do that is Rogue, um, the nineteen eighty. Um, game that mm-hmm. originated the roguelike which you know procedural dungeons and there's there's no towns there's no story really there's a very light story there's only a, you know occasional npcs who travel through the dungeon you, you get to buy stuff from they've essentially abandoned all of the arnesonian to dave arneson the one of the creators of dnd they've abandoned mm-hmm. all of arneson's legacy and said okay let's just go pure numbers and killing and 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 exploring dungeons let's go straight for the dungeon nothing but dungeon all the time mm-hmm. and that's an artistic interpretation of of D. it's it's something where we say okay i'm just going to focus on this one aspect and i'm going to make this aspect as intense as possible and turn it into a whole game and by reducing the scope 
Rogue doesn't feel like D&D, although it almost is wholly derivative in the sense that it only does things that D&D did. It drops so much of the D&D formula that mm-hmm. it feels fresh again. And so you get the whole roguelike genre that comes out of that. And you also get games like Final Fantasy VII and Pokemon and you know many others, which are only just a tiny sliver of the RPG mm-hmm. formula. They drop a lot of the other not, the th- the things that they just deem non-essential to the artistic vision. And that's, I think, where my interest primarily lays is in those games is that, you know, uh, by eliminating a lot of the RPG formula, what do you get? Like, because because the the reason why I'm so interested in those games like Final Fantasy VII is that if you drop all that rest of that, you're committing to something. You're not like, Mm -hmm. how do you analyze D&D? Could you do you think you could do it? Do you think you could analyze Mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons in a meaningful way in less than a lifetime? (laughs) No, there is just so many facts because it was built as this storytelling tools, built as this way to basically create an infinite amount of situations, an infinite amount of characters. So there really is no limit on what you can do. And I think as you just said, Pat, what we see with the third style, the specialization or the specialized RPGs, they basically take a slice or a corner or whatever the hell you want to divide it up. <coughs> excuse me. And then they say, how are we going to turn that into a game? And I think going back to what we were saying a few minutes ago regarding sort of like that split between JRPG and CRPG and that kind of meaningful uh, distinction. We see a lot of JRPGs, a lot of Japanese game developers really go for the specialized RPG. Um, one of my favorites would be like the Shimagami Tensai series, which there is, I can't think of anything like I would see in that game that I would see in a game like D&D. It's very much its own unique thing, and it's because they focus more on a um, counter or a strength-weakness combat system with a more modern storytelling. But I, uh, getting back to the original point, when Dungeons and Dragons was designed, it was developed to be this engine, this massive thing that anyone could then say, I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to use this as my foundation. Right. So if you if you only use one part of it, then you can really do something really unique. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's a lot of why I think that's why people see JRPGs as being so different, so specialized mm-hmm. and so alien to antithetical to what they want out of RPG. Mm-hmm. And if you started with D and D and you went to one of those second mm-hmm. specialization style second, I could see how you could be turned off at first. I mm-hmm. think that you know it, it you might your taste might have to mature into accepting that both sorts of those things can exist and i understand yeah. that perfectly i'm not i'm not mad at anyone who experienced life you know their rpgs that way i came at it from the other angle i started mm-hmm. with the small slice of rpg games yeah. and i grew into you know game, appreciating gigantic monsters like D or or skyrim or something which is another simplification type game you know i, I appreciate that so you know I, I, that was just a good fortune on my part i'm again i'm not trying to be proscriptive about what which rpg mm-hmm. is the best they're all great I'm, I'm not choosing among them. Um, but I will say, you can all hear my dog in the background. <laughs> say hi to Teddy. Um, anyway, so what I would say about RPGs is that if you try and divide them into, you know, by origin or divide them by time period or, co- or platform, I think you'll overlook a lot of the really interesting design trends. Is that especially yeah. like people don't consider what Pokemon is. People don't always think of Pokemon as an RPG. They think of yeah. Pokemon as being Pokemon. Yeah. And yet it is very, very much mm-hmm. an RPG. It is firmly in the the his, historical tr- um, trend of RPGs. So, you know, it, it's easy to overlook and say, oh, that's an RPG and this is not, or this is and this is not, or I don't like RPGs that are like this. RPGs will surprise you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that that's because they were meant to. Because, like you said, like, um, I, you know, RPGs can do almost anything. I, the uh, book I one of the books I was reading in my research for um, for the the Final Fantasy VII book is called Playing at the World by John Peterson, and he in that he talks about um, you know that the the dream of an RPG creator is to allow you to do anything with numbers, right? Mm-hmm. Like with numbers in your imagination, you should be able yeah. to simulate literally anything that is possible, and I think mm-hmm. that's that's a great way to say it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point too. And again, like that use of numbers as a form of abstraction, that is the basis for any RPG ever made. 
Now, I guess one question I want to ask you about, Pat, as we're talking about sort of the distinction between these three schools of RPG thought, with uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago regarding like Baldur's Gate and sort of the Bioware era of trying to, I think they really did bring it mainstream with um, basically removing the need for a dungeon master. With Bioware's like more recent offerings, stuff like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, etc., do you consider them still, I guess, chasing after the uh, D&D or your first type? Or do you think they've moved more into like a specialized RPG or your third type? I think they've moved more into a combination type, really, mm-hmm. because you think they're live action, right? Uh, the, mm-hmm. D- the Baldur's Gate was live action, but there was a lot of pausing. Mm-hmm. You know, you, the pausing was the way to play the game. You couldn't go into your inventory, but you could really stop and think. That was the point. Um, and uh, I, so I think that I think combination took over as the dominant strategy in video games, only because the material for it was ever expanding. As as long as mm-hmm. they're making action action games, you can make hybrid action RPGs, and they'll always be distinct. So you know, if you think like Dragon Age, you're really running around doing a lot of very actiony things. Um, in a, with very actiony controls in a very actiony environment, you're not stopping, thinking, clicking, waiting. Which is that, that's what Baldur's Gate feels like to me, and that's fine for me. I like that, but I also like running around using action abilities. Those are those are both things that I like. So mm-hmm. I think that, but like, yeah, especially in like Mass Effect, where you're shooting so much, that's very much a combination style of game. Can it also be? Can they also blossom from an action RPG into Something that's a simplification style that attempts to be to attempts to fulfill the scope of D anD. d Yes, I believe that they can. I think that the Elder Scrolls is that game, right? The Elder Scrolls mm-hmm. games are trying to do a D anD. d amount of things. Um, mm-hmm. Do they succeed? No, no one ever succeeds. But the ambition and scope are there. Yeah. But but they're also obviously action RPGs. You're playing live. You're playing from a first person perspective. It's just you. There are no party compositions, and there are not strict character classes. So you know, I you know where where are these things going to go? It's it's muddled. The field has become muddled. Yeah. Um, since yeah, especially since I would say ninety six, ninety seven, the 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 clarity with which I can trace RPGs as being in one school or another, it's not as clear. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still think that that framework is is useful, and at least for me and the research that I did, to understand how we got to where we got to in terms of mm-hmm. RPGs. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying a few minutes ago regarding your preference for the style of RPGs that you like, I think I'm the same way. I started playing the JRPG genre. I mean, Final Fantasy One, I, I think, was my first official RPG I played. So I really didn't get a chance to see sort of the large-scale or the D&D style stuff until... A later in my life and I think for me I think I prefer these specialized RPGs where I can see one thing and really be able to explore it, it I think it also has to go back to um, a post that I wrote about abstraction and like that line between whether the player's own involvement in the game is impacting things or the abstraction as we were talking about a few minutes ago the numbers and for me, when I play a game, I want either one or the other. Like I find that with games that try to do them both, or the Omni style that we were mentioning, that it just gets a little, I think, too out of control. Like, I'll give you an example. With the Borderlands series, for instance, which is described as a role-playing shooter, and how you're moving around like you would in a normal FPS... But when you start shooting enemies, you then have the number abstraction come into play. So it feels like very weird to play a first-person shooter where I shoot an enemy instead of him dying. I just see, you know, like numbers fly out of their body kind of thing. And and then when it gets taken to its extreme, when they just bump up the difficulty, then it's like it doesn't matter how well I'm moving and shooting if I don't have the high enough level gun or yeah. if my character is five levels below his level, that means my headshot now doesn't do anything or something like that. Right. I, I, there's nothing more disappointing than if you're going to play a combination game, but one of the parts of that com- – like a composite game, so something made up of multiple genres, but then one of the genres becomes obsolete. Right, so mm-hmm. you have to have numbers because skill will not make up for it, or you have to have skill because numbers will not make up for it. At any mm-hmm. point where you lose one of those things, you've you've really s- screwed your game over because you need to have. If you're going to have two genres in a game, you need they both need to be important, or else yes. you're really going to lose your voice. Mm-hmm, definitely. 
Now, I think another part of the RPG genre, especially in terms of how it's ev- it's evolved and it's sort of become modal, as you were saying a few minutes ago, is again the fact that they're all maybe built from that same basic foundation, again, with numbers used for abstraction. But it gets taken in so many different directions. It's sort of similar to what we were saying with the platformer in the last section, with how you can have the basis be, you know, Super Mario World, but you can then take that in so many different ways. I guess as a question for you, obviously in the platforming section, we know you're, you were a huge fan, or you are a huge fan, of Miyamoto-style Super Mario games, etc. For the RPG side of things, what are some RPGs that you are particularly fond of, or you really admire their design? Well, I mean, my first love were the plot-heavy, world, world-building-heavy world games of Sakaguchi. Um, mm-hmm. So my first, my, the first game, the game I played when I was nine, and I, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to be a game designer, was um, Secret of Mana, mm-hmm. which is, you know, it, it's an action RPG. But at the same time, I... You know, it. it t- I had this, this this crazy world where it's like, wow, these these this mythology and everything. This is we really different than the kind of you know crap cartoons that I watch. You know, in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. I mean, cartoons have come a long way. <laughs> yeah. Think about what Netflix and YouTube have done for that <laughs> and and yeah. Adult Swim and stuff. But they like, just think like that. This is a story, and these are characters where things actually change, and there's something real at stake. Um, that was the first time I really encountered something like that, and. I had this incredibly imaginative world, and I, you know, I, I went on to learn that, of course, it was actually it was very trope heavy, but I didn't know that at the time. But still, to recapture that sense of wonder, um, that's always been a, something that's important. I, I wanted to explain that sense of wonder by writing books about these JRPGs, um, and then hopefully, you know, one day be able to do some of the designing myself, which is something I, I've just begun on recently in my life, um, and I'm looking forward to. But uh, that that story heavy linear ar- ar- authorial RPG was where I started and what I loved first. Mm-hmm. And I didn't when I was younger. Like I played Baldur's Gate, and everyone was like raving about it. And I was like, I just don't understand this. Why don't I level up more often? And that's mm-hmm. because I didn't understand that going from flail plus you know flail to flail plus one that is a level up. It's just mm-hmm. a different kind of level up. Yeah. Um. It's not the it's not the very linear narrow levels that I experienced in Secret of Mana. It's a much wider and more complicated and choosy level up system, and that's you know something that uh, I I've grown to appreciate very deeply. Um. And now I understand that you know you can't you need that wider level up system to have a really great game. So you know when you look at like something like Final Fantasy VII, it does have a wide level of system. People don't appreciate that. They think it's this linear narr- narrative, you know, interactive fiction thing, and it's not at all. It's just that it's very easy to overlook how much of D&D is really in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I've come to appreciate a, a greater variety of RPGs as I've gotten older. And, uh, you know, uh, a big thing for me was World of Warcraft taught me more about RPGs than I think anything ever else mm-hmm. ever did because World of Warcraft is this all-consuming monster which has absorbed yeah. you know everything that any RPG has ever done <laughs> um, but yeah. at the same time it gives you it's a it's a great Hall of Fame tour that it gives you mm-hmm. now I think what's interesting I want to get your thoughts on this again as someone who's been studying RPGs and again looking at things from a deeper point of view from my own personal background like when I was younger again like 8 to 10 kind of thing. I was really into the JRPG genre, and then I really just fell out of it. Like, all the Final Fantasy games just weren't doing anything for me. They all started to, I guess, just, like, bleed or blend together kind of thing. And then I didn't really get back into RPGs until, I think, like, 2004, 2005, when I played Shin Megami Tensai Nocturne. I got to sort of see a different take on the RPG, or a different take compared from Final Fantasy to Shin Megami Tensei. And I'm just wondering if part of that was the fact that, again, like I was only exposed to one kind of RPG. And this sort of goes back to what we were saying in the platformer section, that when Super Mario World came out, that became the foundation. Everyone wanted to be the next SMW. So they all wanted to follow that same design, that same kind of motif. And for the RPG genre, I kind of, or at least for the specialized part with Final Fantasy, after Final Fantasy came out, everyone tried to adapt that. Now, in some cases, we got things like um, Dragon Warrior or Dragon Quest, 
Breath of Fire. And then we had some very unique options, a Chrono Trigger, Earthbound, which I also love those two games. But for me, there was that period where I just completely stopped playing RPGs. They just did nothing for me anymore. I mean, there was a flood of mediocre RPGs in the mid-90s. Mm-hmm. Like, I think of like a lot of the – not titles that Working Designs made, but they, that they imported um, mm-hmm. to U.S. that were you know just sort of mid-quality RPGs that were a little bit derivative – um, you know, f- characters and plots. Like, you know, Final Fantasy is all about, from Final Fantasy 4 onward, they increasingly focused on plot at the expense of, you know, RPG you know, technical Mechanics. nuance. Yeah. 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 Um, but if you don't have really well written characters, you're going to, you're going to fall flat on your face. And a lot of, like, I think of like, you know, like Legend of Lagaya or something, which had a really cool world and kind of a cool battle system, but, about whose characters I, I didn't really care very much because mm-hmm. they weren't voiced particularly well. And so it didn't really stick with me the way that, you know, say Final Fantasy VI did. I did, I did they just didn't, they didn't matter to me enough. So that once I was done with the experience, I was done with it. I wasn't going back. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there was definitely a flood of that in the, in the mid nineties there. And, you know, some of those games I enjoyed once, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't seek to get them on the virtual console if they are, are yeah. even available. Yeah, and but yeah, I can see how that could eject you from the genre in a big way. Yeah. And I think that's an actually a really good stepping stone to a question I want to ask you. Now, in the last section, we talked about some of our thoughts on when platforming didn't or like uh, when we talk about the super hard, pixel perfect or the quote unquote troll games. Now, for RPGs, as we just said, in terms of like a storytelling perspective, they can fall flat on their face. But I guess from your research and your opinion, Pat, from like a mechanics or a structure point of view, do you have any examples? It could even not be from like a whole game, but or just from a design point of view. When an RPG doesn't work, when the mechanics simply aren't doing their job. Um, hmm, that's a good question because I don't I don't tend to think about the bad games very much. I know. Um, I'm trying to think of some of those those mid '90s PS1 ga- games that just fell apart um what would be a good example of that just an rpg that was just really didn't have it um hmm, boy that's a that's a much tougher question than an rpg <laughs> that did because i d- does because i i think about those a lot more often yeah um i you know it's kind of uh heretical for me to say but i would say that secret of Mana th- or two or or seiken densetsu um mm-hmm. three would be mm-hmm. a game that for me didn't have it um mm-hmm. It like, I think it, what it, what it, what it, what the problem was that it tried to do, like, it had some very interesting ideas, very interesting, but it tried to do more than it was really capable of doing in terms of like having, you know, optional party members and different storylines for different people. They, by giving you all those options, you really lost out on the impact of the story. Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh, okay, oh, we've suddenly taken a left turn into this other adventure that I knew nothing about. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that threw me. Um, that's a good, that's a good example of something throwing me off and I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't stare at, stay with it. I know there's some other like RPGs. I'm, I'm not going to come up with the names cause I just haven't thought about them in probably two decades, mm-hmm. but there were definitely some other RPGs where I started playing them and I thought, you know, I like, I don't care enough about this character to grind to mm-hmm. see what happens to him, which yeah. I definitely did when I was playing Xenogears, right? Like there was definitely mm-hmm. there's definitely a point at, in Xenogears where you're like, oh god, I save all this money <laughs> to go buy the best gear parts, um, so I can see the ending. But when I saw the ending of Xenogears, I was so blown away that I was like, well, this was totally worth it. And I, and I mm-hmm. knew the entire time, like I knew that sitting through that you know four hours of text <laughs> in disc two was going to be worth it. I mean, I, I liked the text, but I knew that it was going to be worth it. The payoff was going to be huge because the promise they had made at the beginning was so persuasive. Um, but there were definitely some other RPGs where I was like, you know, like, who is this character? Like, what's with his hair? Um, you know, like, why do I, why do I care about this guy? You know, mm-hmm. like, just because just your mother dies, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the first scene of the game when your village gets destroyed doesn't make me love you. I, I don't I, – that doesn't mm-hmm. make me care about you, you know? Like, yeah. there has to be something else going on there. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's what I would say is that, you know, if you're not – if you're going to ride plot to victory mm-hmm. – it needs to be a good plot. Yeah. Um, but you can get away with having a bad plot if you have amazing mechanics. I'm trying to think of a – like Legend of Dragoon. Um, mm-hmm. It didn't have a bad plot as much as it had just a dreadful translation. Um, mm-hmm. And characters I didn't really care about that much. But um, the attacks were really cool. <laughs> like I like that. That was enough to carry me the whole way. We were good. 
Now, one game that I particularly remember, I think I may have, I don't know if I just didn't give this game, like, a well enough look at, but I think it was, um, I'm trying to think, I think it was Suikoden 4, if I remember right, and I remember playing it, I got, like, through the intro, I thought, okay, this world is great, you know, I want to see what happens, I'm going to build this team up, it all looks good, and then I remember getting to, like, the first official, like, as quote-unquote GRPG battle in that game, and for whatever reason, I just completely bounced off of it, and this was, I don't even remember, at least, I think, like, six, seven years, maybe a little bit more than that, and I still don't remember why that game just threw me off, but it did. And it was just amazing to think about now after spending so many times analyzing games. And as you said, Pat, you don't really think about the bad games all that often. You remember the ones that you were like, oh my god, I love that game. So I just cannot remember why I didn't like this game, but it just... I, I don't think I bounce off a game that fast or that quickly than Suikin and 4. Yeah, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, the, one of the games I bounced off of myself pretty bad was um, Wild Arms 2. Mm. Is that uh, the, as you get deeper into the game, it becomes really grindy and uh, they kind of are at, run out of plot mm -hmm. uh, like halfway through. Like there are no more mysteries or things I want to know or like people I want to see fall in love or whatever. At that point, I'm just like, okay. Um, and now there's a at the end of this there's this game there's a dungeon swarming with monsters mm -hmm. that I don't I don't even want to see the ending. I don't I don't yeah. care. Like I stopped caring about it when you spoiled all the mystery. Like mm -hmm. you know uh, halfway through your game. So like uh, you you already played all your cards. What else am I fighting for here? Yeah, that reminds me of what uh, Chris and of Bravely Default and how I think like the final chapter is just like a boss rush from what I've heard. Yeah, other people have complained to me. I haven't played it, but other people have complained to me that um, you're basically playing the same two levels six, eight mm -hmm. times and that, you know, the, the mechanics get more complex, but that, you know, if you – if you don't bounce, if you bounce off those, those the second time through, you're not going to like the other six times through. Yeah. Now, here's a question I want to ask. I know we're getting close to two hours, so we will start to wrap this up in a few minutes. But this one I definitely want to bring up about sort of these specialized RPGs. I just want to get your thoughts, Pat, on there have been some RPGs I've played which seem to have always seem to come from Japan or JRPG developers that are so out of the box that it's not even funny. Uh, some of the examples that come to my mind would be a game like Knights in the Nightmare for the Nintendo DS, Resonance of Fate for PlayStation 2, and one of my all-time favorite games, The World Ends With You for Nintendo DS. Yeah, I mean, the latter two I, I'm familiar with, um, and they, they are pretty, people have said they're pretty weird, but, you know, mm -hmm. I, one of the things, that you mentioned a DS game, one of the things that I've always been amazed at is that Nintendo really takes takes a lot of risks with their DS. Like, they'll, oh, yes. they'll put risky games out there, like, very, very deeply risky. Yeah, um, Kid Icarus Uprising, I think, is a hidden gem that more people needed to have played. And even, like, beyond Nintendo, the DS and even, like, by extension, the 3DS had a lot of very interesting, unique games. And keeping with the RPG motif, there was, of course, um, Etrian Odyssey, which I f fell in love with, even having no experience with, like, the Wizardry series, which the game was loosely based or um, uh, loosely inspired by. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people. This is a, it's a game I need to get to because uh, almost almost all of the people. I'm, I guess I have to go backwards a step mm -hmm. and say that uh, there are a lot of people making what are called JRPGs today mm -hmm. um, who are not Japanese, which is why yeah. you know the uh, the, mm -hmm. the genre boundaries are are kind of meaningless. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, in as much as they are making them, almost all of them have listed Etrian Odyssey as one of the great influences on them and so it's something i know i need to go back and get into because if that many people like it i oh, just yeah. need to know it may not be for me but i at least need to know what it is because it's, yeah. it seems very influential it seems like it's the latter day final fantasy oh yeah and it's kind of funny i mean hell we could spend two hours just on Etrian and odyssey alone but i remember when it first came out nintendo i think gave it like a six or a seven out of ten a lot of websites hate it saying oh this is an rpg but it's too hard or it doesn't have a great story and then like by the time like Etrian and odyssey three or four came out everyone would basically got on like the page of what this series was about and it started getting really good scores 
And like the first run of Etrian Oz having one and two are really hard to find. They've already uh, released re-releases or um, actually more or less updates on the 3DS. I own both of them. I'm hoping they get to three. And at some point, I hope we get to see Etrian Odyssey 5. But, like, if I were to track sort of my RPG love, it would be, like, the original Final Fantasy, Earthbound Chrono Trigger, then jump to Shin Megami Tensei, and then to, like, Etrian Odyssey, and then to, like, sort of, like, the, as I said, like, these quote-unquote weird RPGs, like, The World Ends With You, Resonance of Fate... And we could even, I mean, at this point, even bringing this up could be a 30-minute discussion, but there's also the strategy RPG genre. And actually, um, as a, I think this may be a quick question for you, Pat, but would you consider games like tactical RPGs or strategy RPGs, do you consider them more like of the specialized crowd in terms of like your three categories? That's difficult to say because... RPG is one of the other fascinating things that I found out doing research for the Final Fantasy VII book. And again, I mm-hmm. would like to recommend once more the um, book Playing at the World by John Peterson because he mm-hmm. gives the best breakdown of this that I could find, um, although I do a much more abbreviated version of my own book coming out, is that RPGs came out of tactical games directly. Mm-hmm. They made the, you know, uh, 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 Gygax and Arneson were making a tactical game that accidentally turned into an RPG, <laughs> essentially. Um, and they were they were like oh this has got legs and so they stuck with it, um, and so it's it's difficult to say whether those tactical RPGs are there for specializations and less like D and D or whether they're more like D and D because they're they're almost a closer to D and D's you know the, the same ancestors like a brother to D and D rather than a child, um, so it's difficult to say but um, you know like certain things like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics or Ogre Battle those are. Mm-hmm. I would say those are closer to specialization in as much as they um, interpret character classes in a very Final Fantasy type way, and they're like lots of lots of power leveling, lots of you know abusing statistical systems on purpose. That's what they want you to do. Um, lots of you know like manip- You know, basically, you're trying to break the game. That's that's one of the things about Final Fantasy that they always yeah. want is for you to okay, here's this game now, break it. And I love that. That's great for me. I think that's an amazing thing. Like I, I like to outsmart, not out, not really outsmart the game designers because they're they they want me to. They're setting me up to outsmart them, right? They're like, okay, find a way to become totally unstoppable, like and become invincible in this game. Take away all the challenge. Find the way to, to overcome this game so that you're an undefeatable monster. I like that. Um, and Final Fantasy Tactics certainly affords the player that ability. So in that sense, it is a very Final Fantasy game. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also has a very rich tactical. Uh, core at it. So, you know, mm-hmm. is it one of those things? No, it's, it is more than one thing. And that's, that's why my three pronged approach to classifying RPGs is not perfect because mm-hmm. a game can be more than one. It's just a useful mental tool for understanding why so many RPGs, why RPGs are so different from one another um, rather mm-hmm. than a classification system that needs to be observed or, or practiced yeah. or, you know, maintained a, as a kind of orthodoxy, which I don't think yeah. is necessary at all mm-hmm. and that kind of breaking is a very fascinating topic again that's another hour discussion yeah in I, itself. I could talk about that for forever alone really and, and like uh, just to briefly uh, i guess touch on it like the sky i think was one of like, the first games or at least one of the first games that i played where the allure and the systems were there to really let you break it and Going back to what we were talking about with Nintendo with giving you like those options, you know, if you want to go this way for the extra play, you can do it, but it's not a force on you. The Sky is a really good example of that. It has like, I need to, I probably need to uh, replay on the PC just to get my head back around, but there's like five or six different systems in that game that are practically optional. There are massive systems that you could spend a hundred hours on that you don't need to do, like the item world. Yeah, a hundred hours up. if you're lucky, man. You could spend a oh, hundred yeah. hours just trying to learn those interlocking systems. This guy <laughs> is very much... I mean, to me, this guy is uh, a specialization of a specialization. Yeah. It takes Final Fantasy's specialization and levels, which, which are a result of you know what they want to do with mm-hmm. characters and plot, and then Hyper extends it even more. It's like a, oh, yeah. a parody of a parody, except it's good. Yeah, and and again, like if you want to play through that game as a basic tactical RPG, you can do that. Yeah, it's there. 
But my God, you start, you know, j- diving into that rapid hole of those mechanics, you will break that game. You will literally beat the main quest like it's nothing. Like, I think this the first time I played this Scott, I did not understand the tact- the advanced mechanics of it, and I got stuck, and I stopped. The second time I played, I started doing, like, um, transmogrifying characters, the item world, and I was like, the final fight of the normal game, I was like, boop, he's dead. That was it. Like, because I just broke that game. And I think the crazy part, as you said, with the parody to a parody, they go a step further. They have, oh, you beat the main game? Now let's just, like, jump the optional content by, like, five, six hundred levels. Oh, or, you yeah, like that? Nine thousand, like, you have to be level yeah. 90 to beat the main campaign of Disgaea, basically. Yeah. You need to be level nine thousand, not necessarily, <laughs> but you need to. the the The, the final enemy is level nine thousand, so mm-hmm. you know, that's a literally a like uh, what is a hundred times? Yeah. So yeah, a hundred times harder than a level ninety guy, and level ninety is something you would never even see in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. So like you're talking you know, a level nineteen enemy would be a high level enemy in Dungeons and Dragons. So you're talking about yeah, quite a level of hyperbole and adaptation that it came from. You know, differing goals and differing artistic mm-hmm. interpretations. So, yeah. you know, it, it, they come a long way. But again, you're right. That is a, a topic on which we could have an entire yeah. show. Yeah. So it feels like I've been trying to make these casts shorter and shorter, but it's not happening, especially when you have two guys who love talking about game design and digging deep. And I mean, hell, even with what we talk about with platforming and RPG, we I don't think we even like touched the surface. We could easily probably spend like four or five more hours sitting here tonight talking. You are probably right. I mean, certainly there is no I have I have never lack for words when it comes yeah. to uh, talking about those two genres in particular. Yeah, me neither. But um, it is getting late, at least in terms of this podcast length and, of course, what time is that we're actually recording. So, unfortunately, we are going to have to say good night. But again, Pat, I would love to have you back on. We can easily take any one of the tangents we started talking about or starting to dive into and probably turn that into – who knows how many more podcasts? Yeah, I'm sure you could probably also find some of your other contributors who would love to debate me on the notion that Dungeons and Dragons did everything an RPG could do, because I'm sure yeah. that would that would make for a rousing conversation. Yep, yeah, definitely. And again, uh, if you want to just pitch your latest book, so that that is going to be the Reverse Engineering on Final Fantasy VII. So yeah, it'll be called Reverse Design Final Fantasy VII. Okay. Um, you'll be able to find it at thegamedesignforum.com, or you can Google the Game Design Forum. I'm usually the first result. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, so the game, the book will be available in two versions. Though so probably late September. Depends on how the editing and typesetting goes. I'm basically a one man operation with occasional part time help, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, there'll be an online version which will be free, which is most of the you know maybe about two thirds of the text, and there'll be an ebook version. Um, all of my ebooks are ninety nine cents. Um, and you'll be able to get that from the store that's on the website. Um, which will have a, about a third more content, sort of going going deeper, like like the optional challenges we've been discussing, going deeper on pretty much each topic in the game or in the yeah in the game and. Uh, sort of expanding on that in, in a in a PDF format. So that'll be something to look for. Um, like I said, probably late September, but if you want to keep track of it, I have an RSS up on the site, mm-hmm. and I also have, you can also find me on Twitter, which will be linked or is for, available through the website, and that's the place to come at me if you have a, a, a burning disagreement with anything I've <laughs> said. I'm happy to entertain that discussion. Cool. And for your previous books, uh, people can find them on the Game Design Forum as well? Yes, um, Reverse Design Final Fantasy VI, Reverse Design Chrono Trigger, Reverse Design Super Mario World, and the most recently released one was Reverse Design (laughs) Half-Life. And I'm sure, uh, considering what we've talked about tonight, I'm sure you have plenty of options for your next book after the Final Fantasy VII one. Oh, I've never short for options, always short for funds. Yes, amen to that. (laughs) All right, again, Pat, it has been a real pleasure hanging out with you. Uh, everyone who's listened to these casts know that I loved. This is like my bread and butter. I love talking about this kind of stuff. So I definitely would love to have you back on. We can, again, turn almost anything into a podcast. So I wish you the best of luck with your with the Final Fantasy VII book. And yeah, definitely don't be a stranger. Let's uh, not spend wait five years and get back in touch again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 
Awesome. So, for everyone listening, we are going to wrap things up for this week's episode of the Perceptive Podcast. Be sure to check out the Game Design Forum and Pat's latest books, as well as his previous ones. Again, um, we can each one is going to be very informative, as even as our discussion here tonight. If you'd like to support Game Wisdom, we have several options available. If you'd like to write a guest piece for the site or be a future podcast guest, you can find submission. You can find all the information under Submissions Wanted on the front page. As I say, we are always looking for new guests, be it students, enthusiasts, members of the industry. As long as you're interested in talking about game design, we'd love to have you on. If you would like to follow me, you can find me on Twitch and Twitter under GW Bicer to get the latest updates of new content, as well as the Game Wisdom YouTube channel, where you'll find daily videos from everything from Let's Plays, video examinations, developer live plays, and more. If you'd like to support Game Wisdom through the Patreon campaign, you can find me on Patreon under Game Wisdom. Any donations would be greatly appreciated. They will allow me to get the monthly funding I need to keep going. If we can hit some of those goals, it will mean more great content for everyone to enjoy. And we have current rewards up for video shoutouts, podcast shoutouts, and a digital CD with more coming down the line. With all that said... Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Perceptive Podcast. Have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you again next time. Take care.